Hey guys, just jumping in at the top of this video, just to give a bit of an intro to my big presentation, How I Cured Stage Fright. I put a lot of effort into this one to hopefully help you on your own journey to stage confidence, beating those nerves, and overall conquering of stage fright. Big ups to Jet for helping me put this one together, and without any further ado, let's get into it. Before I begin, I wanna share a story with you from my childhood. When I was pretty young, I was incredibly shy. I just started playing tennis, mum and dad had got me lessons to play tennis, and I was really excited to get out on the court, and really excited to start playing, but I was cripplingly shy. I was playing with a bunch of other kids, and I never really spent a lot of time with other kids, but I was playing with a bunch of other kids, and as part of that, I also had a coach at the other end of the court, and he was just constantly yelling, barking orders, all that sort of stuff, but I wasn't used to it. And I sat down with mom after many a time of coming back from tennis saying, I had a great time, but bawling my eyes out. And the mom and dad were like, you know that Chris, who my coach was, you know that Chris isn't yelling at you. He's, he's just using his gravelly voice because you're so far away and he needs, he needs to talk to you. And suddenly my perspective shifted and I, my shy demeanor of always feeling afraid or rejecting things or just wanting to not put myself out of my comfort zone in any way, it didn't change overnight, but over time I started to realize that perhaps not everything was happening the way I saw it. Now the reason I'm telling you this story is because on the 30th of September, 2023, I walked out with the Delacoma band in front of almost 600 people in Ringle, Wisconsin. And we played one of the best shows we played all tour. Now, I went from this tennis player who was too afraid to leave my mum's side and who wasn't even comfortable to hang out with the other kids in kindergarten to walking out in front of a bunch of strangers and playing songs in a foreign country. And the reason I'm telling you this is because we often feel like our, our fears and our limitations and the things that hold us back, that they're there forever. And that perhaps everything that we are afraid of or that we have concerns about, that's just who we are. And to be honest, that's not true. This is the story I'm going to share with you about how we can beat your nerves, beat your stage fright like I did together. So let's get into it. Confidence isn't a gift. It's just a state of mind. As I mentioned earlier, I used to be really shy. So I can appreciate your performance nerves. I never would have imagined addressing a camera or getting out in front of a bunch of people and playing music. That was terrifying to me. I want to begin this journey for you and your own stage fright by ticking off a couple of myths, by busting a couple of myths. Myth number one, imagine everyone is naked. Everyone's heard the adage that in order to make yourself feel more comfortable, and to ease those nerves, just imagine everyone's naked or imagine everyone's in their underwear. Now this is flawed for a couple of reasons. The main reason is it's distracting you from the reason you're there and the reason you're meant to be performing or addressing public in, in some aspect. It's taking you away from the audience itself. The other reason why this is a negative is by utilizing a third party tool or by focusing on something that's not really happening in the crowd, you're actually making it easier for you to forget because you're focused on something else completely. And I take you to an example where you're in a group setting perhaps where there's multiple other people and they're all doing their bit and it comes to your turn to maybe say or sing something and you're just looking at something else. And it's, it's the equivalent of the, the butterflies and you're sort of looking at a shiny thing. Suddenly you're not actually in the moment and you're not focusing on what you're meant to be there to do. So you're more likely to forget because you're focused on what the audience are meant to be doing. Myth number two, just slow down. Now everyone has been told, a lot of this guy has been told, you just gotta slow everything down. And that the only way to really fix a problem, to get past a nerve issue or anything like that is just slow everything down. And that's not quite true. Now as someone who used to have an extremely fast default rate of speech, 
that I did not really know how to meter. This used to be my old default rate of speech. I used to speak about this quickly because I didn't really understand that by speaking faster people couldn't really understand or understand what I was trying to get out, what I was trying to say, trying to process my words and they weren't able to figure out what I was trying to say time and time again. That was very easy for me. I have had to relearn that habit. But by speaking everything super, super slow, you put everyone to sleep. And that's where the default part comes in. Doing anything in a default state is where we lose engagement. Doing anything in a default state is what's gonna get people disengaged. Whether that means you're playing all your songs at 30 beats a minute and everyone's falling asleep, or whether you're playing everything at 165 and there's no light and shade. It all sounds like the same song. We've all been at a gig where it sounds like someone's playing the same song for 45 minutes because there's no difference, there's no change. They introduce the same song for the same amount of time every time. Any of these elements, especially performance elements that you're doing, that you're either slowing down or you're just doing in a default rate, that's gonna disengage the audience. So every time, whether you're a band or a soloist, every time you get on stage, be there to perform every single time. Be ready. We tend to be more concerned, we tend to be more worried when we're not prepared because we're concerned that we're gonna forget something or we're gonna make a mistake. This consumes us, especially on stage, when our assistance tools, our notes, our safety blankets, they're not there for us. So how do we remedy this? Practice and rehearsal. You need to practice and rehearse correctly though, otherwise you're just setting yourself up for failure. When I was in the sixth grade, my band leader at the time, Ian, he said something super insightful that has always stuck with me. When you practice, you're learning your parts. When you rehearse, you're there to learn everyone else's. If you ever played in a band or jammed with some real quality musicians, you'll know that that is true. When you're at home practicing, ensure that you're focusing on the gaps, on the things you don't know. The moment you start falling into that habit of sort of playing things you enjoy or just going through the motions, you've actually stopped practicing and you're just playing. Which is fine, but that's not what you're there to do in your own time. My tennis coach, Jeff, had a big thing to say to me when it came to practicing. And he said, practicing perfectly makes perfect. Just practicing willy-nilly or just doing things doesn't necessarily get you to the end result you're chasing. Rehearsal, on the other hand, is more of an experiment in how you work with others and how you play with other people. You should already have your parts competently down before you get in the rehearsal space. Because as I said, the rehearsal room is there for you to understand how all the parts play together. And by not being prepared, you're also setting yourself up for failure. The way you rehearse is the way you'll perform. So this not only leads to more productive rehearsals, but it also leads to more confidence on stage, therefore easing those jitters. The way I look at rehearsals is the way a lot of, especially jazz musicians, look at theory. I want to know the parts so well that I forget the parts. And by saying that, I mean that I want to know the bits that I'm meant to be playing so well in my own time that when I get in the room or I get on the stage, I'm just muscle memory. I'm just running through the motions because I don't have to specifically think about every moment as if I'm learning it for the first time. So how do you combine practice and rehearsal and also combine combating stage fright all at the same time? There's actually a magic solution for that. Open mics. Open mics are an extremely useful resource, especially if you've never had any sort of stage time before, you've never performed in front of an audience. Open mics are gonna be your best friend. Whether you're a band or a soloist or a comedian or whatever sort of performing art you're in, by going to an open mic night, you're not only potentially getting your first opportunity at stage time, but you're also being able to work out what works, what doesn't work in the most raw setting. Testing your skills in front of any audience is only going to help you get more familiar with the foreign nature of performing. 
This is because the fear associated with being on stage and performing in front of others is just foreign and unfamiliar to you. So how exactly do you get familiar? Much like with any muscle, you need to strengthen it. You need to work hard in order to get more familiar and, and to build up the strength in it. So by going to open mics and practicing more and all those sorts of things, you become more ready as well as more comfortable going out of your original comfort zone and therefore helping with those stage fright nerves. But Bailey, it's not always as simple as that. What if the band are ready to play shows and I'm not quite ready to play shows? Well, that's okay. In this industry, this is pretty common that you're not gonna be able to just be ready all the time. Something's gonna come up, whether it's a change in set or someone offers you a show last minute or perhaps just the band are ready and you're not quite there yet. These things are gonna happen. What counts is how you react to it. When I was in high school, I was the only drummer in my year level. It meant that I got to play with every sort of genre, lots of different age groups, and on top of the stuff I was doing outside of school, I played in a bunch of different bands in class. This gave me a taste for it all. I want to take you back to one night in particular when it came to high school. It was a performance we had for the end of the year, a lot of people there, different age groups, different year levels, and it was one of the very few chances that our school bands that we were playing for the Year 12 Music Group got an actual opportunity to play together in front of an audience. Now for anyone who knows about the VCE or any of the school programs, you play an exam environment at the end of the year and you play to two people that don't clap. So we never really got an opportunity to ever play in front of an audience, so this was a pretty big opportunity for us. I was set to play with my classmates and I was just in the, just in the area where we were playing in the, in the music room just getting ready and I get a knock on the door and the conductor from the concert band she comes in and says, can I have a word with you for a sec? She says to me, I just found out that the other drummer that normally plays in the concert band, he's not coming. And I'm gonna need you to fill in tonight. If that's okay, three songs, here's the sheet music. Now, for anyone who has known that I am happy to throw myself in the ring, uh, a bit of a baptism of fire, if you will, they'll be pretty comfortable with that. And that's probably fair, because when I think about it now, I like that sort of spontaneity. But I'll set the scene some more. When I was asked that, it was 20 minutes until curtain. And the conductor said, you've got between 10 and 15 minutes to learn these three songs based on this sheet music. Now, had I ever read the sheet music? No, but I, I was good enough at reading sheet music to get by. Had I ever heard the songs before? No, they weren't look upable songs either. I couldn't just YouTube one of the songs and try and figure out if I was gonna be able to figure out the parts. So. I got up on stage with 15 minutes notice to open the night and we're playing all these tracks that I've never heard before and in that moment I realized I didn't have the time to be ready. I only had the time to be present. I, I couldn't figure out, oh my god, have I made a mistake? Am I doing it wrong? Have I got some sort of uh, cue incorrect? I just had to make sure that the audience at the time didn't know that I was not part of that band and that I could bluff it through enough and be present in the moment enough to get by. Now I absolutely understand that a baptism of fire like that is not everyone's cup of tea. And I had not really done that sort of thing before myself. So it was a bit nerve wracking for me also. But when I was in that moment, I remember vividly the feeling of being free and having really no expectations. I was there to do a job, but there were no expectations on me that I had to do something a certain way or that I'd rehearsed for six months and oh my gosh, I made one mistake and we've been rehearsing for so long. I just put it all out there and although I wasn't able to be ready, I was able to be present. Be on the lookout to learn. Now learning comes from a lot of places. Your only job is to be looking for those opportunities. I think that the biggest difference or the only difference potentially between those that continually make the same mistake over and over and over and those that learn from them it's simply how much attention people pay to what's there to be gained and what's there to be learned from an opportunity. So where you can learn, you can ultimately grow. And as a, as a musician, as a performer, as anyone, that should be your number one goal whenever you're trying to improve. So as a musician, where can you learn? Here are my top three places to learn. 
Number one, easy port of call. Other musicians, other people that are doing what you're doing or doing something similar to what you're doing, whether that be professional musicians at big scale gigs, you know, going to open mics and seeing the other people, seeing your mates play, even people standing in front of a camera trying to educate you on something you might not know so much about. Any of those things. You can learn from lots of different musicians, lots of different ways, and that should be port of call number one. And as part of that, it is a great tool to learn both what to do and what not to do, which are equally as important. Number two, from the audience, from the people that you're there to entertain or you're there to educate. Whatever the situation may be, you need to factor in the audience and utilize any tools you can to learn from them. People will know, especially if it's not your first rodeo getting up on stage, that the audience will tell it how it is. Whether you like it, whether they're right, the audience will always tell it how it is and they'll always be up front with you. So all your job is to do is to just figure out how to learn from that and take it on board in a respectful way. Often our instinct to any sort of criticism, especially when it comes from an audience, is just to reject it because it's something to do with your art, it's something to do with your expression, and nah, it's just those people in the front, they don't understand. And while there is definitely an element of that, I wanna give you an example of the stand-up comedian. So the stand-up comedian, they come into the show and they tell 10 jokes at an open mic and all of them bomb. Now, perhaps that was the audience, perhaps that was the room, perhaps that was multiple different things. But then, at the six month mark, they're doing those same 10 jokes and they're still bombing. At what point is it the audience and at what point is it the material? The idea of a comedian is to make you laugh. So if you're not getting the laughs, then maybe something needs to change. The same is true as a musician. If you consistently play certain songs that you notice kill a room or you play covers that you may really enjoy but no one even knows or you're just speeding through things or talking too much and not really getting to the music, any of those different things, if they start to affect the performance in a way that the audience aren't loving, you gotta take that feedback on board and you gotta learn from that. You, gotta learn from yourself. And the best way to do that is record and review. By recording and reviewing yourself, like I discussed with my good friend Jet the other day on another video, which you can watch after this one, record and review is the best way to give yourself unbiased, completely objective feedback. Now, understand that it can only be as objective as your eye, and as you look back at your own videos, and I've done the same, you may cringe and want to hide in a bowl, but by the same token, it's raw, it is what it is. If you play that show and you look back at it and go, that was so good, and then you see that you played everything so, 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 so fast, well then, maybe it wasn't that good. And also, there's nothing wrong with that. That's how you grow, that's how you get better. And doing it in your practice, doing it in your rehearsal, ultimately doing it live on stage. I've done that so many times from primary school to now, and I still do it, to get a better understanding of what I'm doing and how I can go from where I am now to improving based on what I know the audience is seeing. I'm gonna share one example with you which I am horrifically embarrassed about, but apologies in advance to any Led Zeppelin fans. Back when I was at uni, uh, I had a course and as part of that we did a performance and this performance we're about to see is us doing Immigrant Song unbelievably too fast and I knew it was too fast at the time. Perhaps it was nerves, perhaps it was a multitude of things, but the main reason I know how horrifically fast it was is because it was videoed. So I'm gonna play that right now and I apologize in advance. Yeah, that was hard to watch, I know. It was hard to listen to, it was hard to edit into this. But I understand that after listening to hundreds of hours, it feels like, of iPhone and GoPro footage like that to better understand my playing. The more resources you use to learn from, you're only gonna get better. There's no limit to that. If you wanna see 10 gigs a week and all these other things at the same time, as well as recording and reviewing yourself, you're just increasing the amount you can grow. And by growing more, by getting more of that confidence, you're just making it easier to get past that stage fright and those nerves 
based on real life experience. Empathy is defined as the ability to understand and share the feelings of another. As we watch people try something and experiment and do something for the first time, unfortunately, our first instance and our first instinct is often to ridicule and to judge. But that primal collectivist self-preservationist in us that wants to always find someone who's a little bit below us, that's not healthy. And as part of that, it also triggers that same feeling when we're on stage. Because we feel as someone that is objectively judging someone else, that when we get up on stage, someone's judging me. The more you think about how someone made a mistake and oh, that's a little tiny tweak, I would never do that, the more you're gonna be acutely aware that everyone in the audience may be doing the same to you, even if they're not. So by resetting your mindset and by factoring in the judgment of others from an outside perspective, looking, looking at someone else, by resetting that mindset, you'll find that not only are you learning more and you're watching to learn and engage rather than watching to judge and ridicule, you'll find that when you get up on the stage, you're not actually as worried. And the less worried you are, the more you're able to focus on what you're doing. You're able to be present. And those stage fright nerves, those fears of ridicule and making a mistake, they seem to go away a lot quicker than they ever used to. This section is all about the physical. When you come towards something that is evoking your fight, flight, or freeze response, you tend to get the shakes. And that's simply just excess of adrenaline. That's supernatural, but I have two ways to mitigate that, two ways to sort of get ahead of that and constructively ease the adrenaline and stop the shaking. Method number one. I'm not gonna for a second pretend to show you what his breathing technique is, but if you ever heard of the Wim Hof method, I found it out via a Yes Theory video years ago now when they actually went to his home in Poland and did it, when he was sort of new to the things and, and not so much all the rage like he is now. But the Wim Hof method is a great breathing technique to essentially by yourself, settle yourself, and I suggest looking up that video or looking up his work to try and get a better understanding because there's hundreds on YouTube of how to do it basically. Exercises. Now, by exercises, I don't mean anything super strenuous. I just mean utilizing the space you have in the green room, in the pre-space, wherever you are, even if it's just outside the venue or at the back where no one can see, doing things like push-ups or boxer step, which uh, there'll be a video of, of me sort of doing an abridged version of that, or even just like sit-ups or just jumping up and down, like star jumps, anything to sort of get, get the wigglies out essentially because you just need to move that adrenaline to be somewhere else. And by sort of firing yourself up and getting rid of the shakes in a way that is constructive, that's a good way to do it as any. I wanna start this section by first really stating how important this one is. As a tool to being able to mitigate your nerves and just have that objective focus before you get on stage, when you're on stage, after you get off stage, this one is a key one. Whose responsibility is it for your gear to be in check, for your snare to be in tune when you get on stage? The answer is yours. It's not the soundies, it's not the venues, it's yours. The role of the soundie is simply to provide a sonic solution, a high quality sonic solution to connecting the venue stuff with your stuff. Much like it's not your responsibility to make sure the PA is tuned, to make sure you know, the bar has drinks and to make sure the venue is set up ready to go before you start putting things on stage. It's not the venue's responsibility to make sure your snare's in tune and your MacBook's not flat. And this is where we get into the art of the troubleshoot. Being able to troubleshoot the following three areas is super important. And I've cut them into my top three, which I think really, really encapsulate what you could be doing for yourself before and while you're on stage. Know your gear better than anyone else. It's only your responsibility to be aware of that. So know your gear better than anyone else. As a drummer, I feel like 
there's a bit of a divide. There's some drummers that know everything about everything. They know their setup, they know what to bring, they've got a spare of everything, and then you've got some that just sort of rock up and hope for the best. I feel like, by and large, guitarists are pretty gearhead sort of vibey, and therefore they know everything. They know about their tone, they've got 47 pedals for the tuner, all those sorts of things. They're a bit more aware of that sort of stuff. So knowing your gear better than anyone else already right off the bat avoids so many issues. Being proactive is your best friend and this is proactive tip essentially number one. Always come prepared. Now I alluded to this in the first one about knowing your gear and knowing how everything works and how to set it up but bringing that extra stuff, having extra bits and bobs with you, spare batteries, extra cables, spare leads, making sure that you're prepared not only for the gear you have, which you know better than anyone else, but in case something breaks, in case someone else's thing breaks. How much of a hero are you when you say, oh, I've got an extra three guitar leads because I brought them? The amount of times I've had in my bag guitar leads and have helped a bass player or a guitar player because they didn't bring a guitar lead or something was forgotten, at the end of it, you just don't want to be the one that forgets. And if you're prepared or extra prepared with enough gear for yourself and about three mates, that's fantastic. So being prepared with the gear that you know better than anyone else, this is ultimate proactive preparation. And as people would be well aware, if you know the five Ps, prior planning prevents piss poor performance. And that was six. So this is why I play drums, I can't count. On stage fixes. Now on stage fixes is the third and most loose, I suppose, of of the preparation techniques for, for troubleshooting because there's no exact science as to how to sort of do this third one, but on stage fixes can just be anything, whether that be the floor tom, for instance. So the floor tom, the leg has shot through and, or it's broken, perhaps it's snapped, who knows? And you're like, okay, I now have a floor tom that's in my leg because it's fallen and I don't have a spare leg. Not a problem, because I've got my drumsticks on the floor tom, I'll put another stick in the floor tom. Now, you can't fix that at the time, and unless you have someone very fantastic that's helping you out and teching for you, or someone who's just watching in the crowd that knows how to get up and can help, you can't fix that at the time. But because you were knowing your gear better than anyone else, and because you were prepared enough to bring your drumsticks, you can now think of a way to fix this, do a bit of a half ass sort of fixing scenario that just gets you by for the rest of the gig, or perhaps just after the song for the next song until someone can source you a better drum or another tom leg or whatever it may be. But then also you've got on stage fixes that are more song based, like the singer extends something but for a fifth bar rather than an eighth or a twelfth. So suddenly we're counting in fives and you've got to try and figure out how to loop it all back together. Your job as the drummer is to essentially hold it all together. And as the drummer you also have the vantage point of the entire stage. You can see no one is behind you. You can see everything that's happening in front. So utilize that to your advantage, whether that be you just noticed the guitar strap's broken and you want to make bedroom eyes to the person on the side of stage saying, yep, get the guitar ready for him. It's anything like that. But as the non-drummer, if there's any opportunity to maybe pad out time a little bit as the singer because you notice that that guitar thing happened or a string's broken and you've got to figure out how to sort of mitigate that, it's about being open to being on the fly and knowing your stuff, being prepared enough and also being comfortable enough on stage, which comes with experience, being comfortable enough on stage to sort of make a, make a change on the fly. One thing I do want to mention though when it comes to the on-stage fixes is there's a fine line between addressing the elephant in the room and faking it till you make it. Now a lot of people will say that it's important that when you are walking on stage, you know. For instance, you walk on stage and you're wearing a giraffe head and everyone's wearing pink suits. Perhaps to not mention that, people are factoring in less about your music and more about why you're wearing a giraffe's head and everyone's wearing pink suits. And that's cool because you can utilize that. As someone that used to wear space suits in a band, I can tell you for a fact that a lot of people would look at it and look at that before they heard the music. It was a good attention grabber, but then we would address that in the song cheap suits and from there we've addressed that elephant in the room and now we're all focusing on the music again. But if I'm, I don't know, singing away and I notice that I've stood on my shoelace, 
I don't need to bring that up when the guitarist is tuning at the end of the next song. It's not funny. It doesn't add value to anything. And any of those little cringy bits, and I can think of many a time that that's happened in my experience, those cringy bits that don't add anything to it or perhaps something that no one saw or a little inside thing where we skipped a bridge but we all played it fine, we just all went afterwards, oh, we forgot that. Bringing that up, doing those sorts of things, it just makes you look like a fool. So as much as on stage fixes and coming up with things and ways to beat stuff on the fly is great, you don't always have to address everything because that's half the fun. You just, you fixed it, you talk about it afterwards and you go, oh my God, can you believe that? How crazy. So troubleshooting is a real combination of knowing your gear better than anyone else, being prepared in case option one doesn't work out for you, and then being able to work on the fly with the other people in the band or if you're by yourself. So by combining all these troubleshooting methods, you can walk in there with a confidence that goes outside the performance, but you can walk in with a confidence that says, if something was to break, something to go wrong, I got it covered. Between an unrehearsed mistake, mistake, and improvisation, there's a very small gray area. And that gray area is perspective. Have you ever just sat with your instrument? Perhaps you're sitting at home, playing with your instrument, and you're just trying different things to a metronome, for instance, or you're just noodling on some different ideas with not necessarily any objective, just playing around. Even better than that, have you ever tried it with other musicians? Because noodling with other musicians and improvising and trying different ideas with certain limitations, be it the instrument you're using or the tempo you're playing to or anything like that, that helps you grow and it helps you get better at your instrument in a way that is less structured, less song-based, more focused on the actual instrument and getting better at it, understanding it. Now, one thing I learned when I was doing drum lessons back in Victoria was I noticed a lot of people I was friends with doing guitar lessons and stuff and they were learning songs. They're like, hey, coach, you know, hey, hey, teach, I want to do this song. And then they'd teach them that song. They'd teach them the parts, the chords, the arrangement, etc. And that's great, but I had an experience where I was shown how to learn songs. Not just how to learn a song, but how to learn the learning. How to understand that this process is X, this is the sight reading, these are the certain elements, and how to apply certain bits and bobs, certain formulas to other songs. And this really educated and encouraged my own improvisation. So by improvising, I don't just mean noodling any old thing and it's sounding like nonsense, which is how I started. Putting in random fills that were not really appropriate or tasteful. It's about understanding the conversation of music and where you can essentially troubleshoot creatively. But Bailey, how does that help with my nerves on stage? Well, it's easy because the more you understand about, like I said before, your gear and you know being prepared and making sure you've got everything, the more you understand about your instrument creatively, the more you understand that when someone starts playing a little bit of a longer bridge section and your solo that you normally play is over, but we're doing it for another run through, by understanding your instrument, understanding the key, understanding all these creative elements and musical elements, you're able to keep going, you're able to riff it up, jam it up, you're able to try different things in a more melodic, free flowing sense, rather than it being, okay, the song goes for two minutes, that's this part, that's that part, that's this part, I know all the notes, I hope nothing changes. Because often these things do happen, they dynamically change. You do a breakdown that you get the crowd involved for. You may not rehearse it that way, you should, but you may not rehearse it that way. So when the crowd starts clapping along, and you know, I think about when I play with Dell all the time, we were in the States and used to play My Kind of Woman, he'd do a talk, like a monologue speech that would go for like, sometimes up to two and a half minutes where we're just filling time for that two and a half minutes whilst he goes around, he gets up on the stage and he walks around the venue and he starts t talking to people and interviewing people whilst we're just playing the breakdown bit in the middle. And being able to improvise, being able to be free flowing like that, that's a skill that you definitely want to have in the holster as you start playing with different musicians, as you start playing with better musicians, and as you start playing bigger shows where people want to get involved, the crowd wants to be a part of it. The more you do that, the better you're going to get at your instrument, at playing with other people, and ultimately 
at getting those nerves put at bay because you already know what to do with the gear and now you know how to melodically communicate that with your instrument. To finish, I want you to think of 30 words that describe your musicality, your musical ability. I'm gonna give you five seconds. Have you done yet? The answer is probably not, because five seconds to think of 30 words to describe you, that's pretty tricky. But what if I told you, think about one word today, think about one word the next day, one word the day after, etc., etc. You'd find that after 30 days, you could quite easily come up with ways to describe you, whether it be you as a person, you musically, because you've had 30 days. The reason I tell you this is because the journey to beating your stage fright, to overcoming those nerves, whilst the tools I've mentioned are useful, it's not gonna happen overnight. It's not gonna happen in one gig, 10 gigs, but that's okay. In this world which is so addicted to the easy route, to the three tips to get rich quick, or you know, the one fill that you need to know in order to get paid for playing drums, or you know, the, the seven day method in order to get healthy and have a six pack. Imagine what you could achieve if you just tried something a little bit difficult. I wanna leave you with a quote from American entrepreneur and speaker, Tim Ferriss. He says, reality is negotiable. So get out there and start negotiating the reality that you want. Thank you for watching until the end. I really appreciate it. This has been a big project I've been working on for a while now, and I've been so excited to have it out in the world for you guys to all enjoy. Big thanks to Jet, my main man, for helping me put this together today, as well as everyone that has given me support and given me recommendations on how I can grow this video and grow the community to assist other musicians get to a stage where they're comfortable and they're thriving. If you're interested in connecting with me, you know how to find me, it's Instagram, it's Facebook, you can drop a comment on this video or any other of my videos. Uh, there's also the Ask a Muso podcast, if you're really keen to have a conversation, hit me up and see if we can tee up an episode uh, for the Ask a Muso podcast, because I'm always looking for new musical talent to, to talk to, to help the audience find their next favourite artist. As always guys, until next time, I'll see you later. Thank <laughs> you.